My name is Leanne Buchanan, and I'm the executive director of Venture Cafe. We're going to go back into the AI space and talk about the impact of artificial intelligence and big data on the marketing mix. So we're going to be joined by John Santiago, CEO of M8, Peter Kosmala, the vice president of platform at DataZoo, and the conversation will be moderated again by a Miami hometown hero. We've got Dr. Jeff Dirk, Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at the University of Miami. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks very much. So good afternoon, everybody. So one of the things we want to talk about today is, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning are really transforming our expectations <laughs> for virtually all aspects of digital media. And one of the things we want to talk about today is how is artificial intelligence, machine learning, really impacting the marketing and advertising mix? And I'm really pleased today, as you just heard, to have John Santiago here, who's CEO of M8, and Peter Kosmala, who's VP for Platform at Data Shoe. So thank you, guys. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So why don't you, uh, uh, John, why don't you go first and just sort of tell us a little bit about yourself how you got into the field and what your company does. Great. Um, thanks very much for having me, everyone, today. Uh, my name is John Santiago. I am the founder and CEO of an agency here, uh, born and bred in, uh, in Miami called M8, um, with offices throughout Latin America. We focus on the US Hispanic market and, uh, and Latin America. Um, fortunate in the last uh, 30 days or so to uh, get acquired by a great network holding company called the Dentsu Aegis Network. So that's exciting news for us. And, um, and we focus specifically on how we can help uh, brands and consumers connect in what we call the connected life uh, through the use of great data and insights uh, to make a valuable connection and give meaningful, um, uh, meaningful relationships between the two. And Peter, how about you? Great. Thank you again for having me. Uh, bienvenidos a todos. Y muchas gracias a mi amigos. Acon Digital. I'm Peter Cosmala, VP of Platform for DataZoo. We are a Boston-based uh, programmatic media platform. Uh, if you don't know what programmatic media is, very briefly, it's, it's the real-time bidding and selling of, of digital online advertising. Uh, very machine-driven. It's AI-driven in, in our example. Um, prior to that, I was a lobbyist for the advertising industry. I worked for the 4As, the American Association of Advertising Agencies, um, based in Washington. Uh, John's agency is a member. Uh, they're also a, a customer of uh, Acon Digital, which is uh, uh, here on the floor. In fact, if you want to know more about DataZoo, stop by the Acon Digital booth. It's right next to the launch pad stage for more on that. Um, prior to forays, I worked for the largest association representing the privacy profession, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, or the IAPP. And I mention this because this is really sort of informs my perspective on what we're going to talk about today. Um, because I feel like a multidisciplinary approach is really the best way to view a new technology like AI. AI. So I'm going to look at it from a you know, consumer privacy perspective, um, how agencies and brands look at it, and as a technologist. And I think that's pretty critical for something that's evolving. Great. Thank you. So one fundamental question maybe for the audience, and, and John, I'll turn it over to you first, is what does machine-driven or machine learning live in? driven advertising mean? Sort of describe how it all works. How does AI machine learning impact on advertising today? So I think that um, using data to inform your advertising strategy um, is, uh, has been around for a millennial, um, uh, as early as when people were just going door to door and handing out flyers, or that long black strip that was sitting in front of your home counting the amount of cars that drove by to inform uh, the demographic makeup of, of you know, where you lived uh, so that a brand can approach you and approach the people in your area in a specific way. It's just done much quicker, more efficiently now with the vast amount of data that we get. And then using machine learning uh, and AI to be able to do that in a quick, efficient manner where we're, we're then able to develop unique creative or unique ideas that are distributed at speed and scale. Um, to reach consumers at what we believe the right moment, the right time, with the right message, to add value to their lives, not necessarily the concept of advertising that many people think of, which is the interruption model, uh, where you're just speaking to the masses. Now it's 
um, very critical to use data. And we, we have a term in, in my agency where we say uh, data equals caring. So if you choose to use data, it's almost like going on a date. Um, <laughs> you learn about someone, you understand their likes and dislikes, maybe the things that they're uh, interested in. And on the second date, uh, you use that to sort of manifest the relationship and dig deeper and, 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 and grow as, a, uh, as friends, as a couple, whatever it might be. And so that's the same thing that we look at is the way that brands approach consumers these days, is use that data to care about the consumer, use that data to be personal, um, ask questions, uh, and then deliver on the promise of adding value to them, not necessarily just interrupting their lives for the sake of interruption. So Peter, maybe you could describe to the audience some of your experiences or your perspective on how specific is the marketing today in terms of reaching me, for example, as Jeff Dirk, or reaching me as a 59-year-old male who happens to live in Miami. So talk to us a little bit about how much information is available and how it affects the uniqueness of the advertising that's, that we encounter. No, great question. Um, and there is so much data now available about you, about others. Um, in fact, what we've seen is sort of the democratization of data. It's just there's so much of it now, and there's so many people gathering it, working with it, processing it, where it sort of used to be back in the day you know, the sole domain of only certain companies or certain institutions like government agencies or universities or other places. So I think from a, you know, from a technology standpoint, from a platform standpoint, it's about striking that right balance between you know, knowing you to the extent that it's useful to build a relevant, you know, meaningful human connection, as John is describing, with you as a consumer on behalf of a brand without feeling too, it getting feeling too creepy for you and, yeah. and invasive for you. And, you know, brands, advertisers are ultimately after audiences. So it's not so much the one-to-one -one relationship, that's direct marketing, but, but rather just reading, reaching audiences of which you're a part, a segment, in a fundamental and effective way that's going to form a lasting brand relationship. And the more data that's available is the smarter that that process can become. It can become more intelligent, so it's quicker. It's responding to real-time behaviors like where you are, what you're doing, the context, your interests. Um, and the intention is to make it as relevant as possible, and again, without sort of crossing a line. And that's a, very, that's a challenging endeavor. And some do it well, and others cross the line and pay for it. I so, think, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, well, there's one thing. You mentioned the creepy factor in crossing the line. I think that's pretty relevant to what's been in the market and going on today. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, I think if you're being thoughtful and, uh, and you have empathy as a brand, that's, that's, I mean, the more data you have about a, a consumer, the more empathetic you can be. But the challenge, I think, in the, op the, 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 the opposite side of the coin is that consumers, we are, not, we are not used to brands being empathetic to us. We're not used to them understand, knowing that they understand so much about our lives. And so when, when we do cross that line or we do things that are too personal, they get the creepy factor. So um, you know, one area that I think that we're challenged with right now in a, in a very big way, and many are answering the call, is making sure that the data that we gather about consumers is, uh, is in their control, is that they have uh, an understanding of the data that they're sharing more than anything, that they understand that they've opted in to share the certain data in exchange for the value that you're getting on a platform or you're getting from anything that you're, you're getting from either a brand or uh, a publisher platform, um, and then giving them a, a, a quick and easy way on a daily basis to either opt in or opt out of that. Uh, and update it because our lives do change. And so what I might want to share today in exchange for value of using a great platform, I may change my mind tomorrow. And so that needs to be a very easy process, otherwise I lose trust. And once you lose that trust, I think that's where we are today where we've got some trust issues. But, um, but there is great value in, a, in, a, in an individual sharing personalized data in order to get a better experience. Again, it's not about interruption advertising and marketing, it's about if I share information, what I should get in return is a phenomenal experience uh, from either a brand advertiser or the platform that's, that's allowing me to participate in that community. Um, but it should all be on my terms, and I think that's the challenge we're suffering today. Yeah, trust is really at the core of this. John's absolutely right. And you know, it's exciting to behold what AI is capable of, where it can take us. It's just going to do things smarter, quicker, um, you know, with greater efficiency and, and greater accuracy. But the consumer's voice needs to be in that equation. So companies have to be very thoughtful about, you know, that means notifying them what's happening, helping to sort of explain, you know, this data is being used to give this message to you for this reason. 
Advertising is, for one, subsidizing the experience you're having, whether that's you know, posting a video, sharing photos, blogging, you know, whatever it happens to be, the content that you're enjoying online, it bears repeating, is ad supported. That's the fundamental business model. So if we collectively as a society, society don't want that, you know, that's a decision that could be made and you could switch to something like a subscription model or something else. But knowing that that's where we are today and that this is how you're getting it, then the onus on the business is, well, let's do this in a respectful way that's certainly consistent with law and regulation. And there's a lot of different ways that's approached around the world, particularly here. But if you're respectful of that, and you just, as, it, as I say, you notify them what's happening, you give them a voice in that process. If they want to opt out, they can. They may not. They may feel comfortable. I know what's happening. I'm glad you told me. Let's proceed. I think certainly among younger consumers today, they're, they're more acclimated to this reality. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would sort of put the responsibility to consumers, too. Maybe a little provocative to suggest, but I think consumers have a role here, too, to understand that they're living in a data-driven environment. In some, in some instances, it's impossible to erase this data. It's out there. You can de-link from it. But to be thoughtful about what you're doing online and, uh, and just know that part of that responsibility is on you as a consumer as well. So we don't have something like the EU's general data protection uh, policies or general data protection regulations here in the US. Not yet. Is this something where you think that the marketing advertiser, advertisers or data gatherers could get ahead of our legal or our legislative system and sort of come up with some industry standards for how data is managed that consumers elect to make available or that all data has to be elected by the consumer. I, I appreciate your thoughts on that because it's an issue that, as we all know, recently came up with Mark Zuckerberg you know, and the uh, Cambridge Analytica and his testimony in front of Congress. It's becoming more in the public's view, and I'm curious if you think as an industry it's your responsibility to get ahead of that or, or not. So yeah, I have some thoughts. And John, John, John go ahead. Too. Yeah. So uh, I always believe it's best to take um, the first step uh, and uh, control the destiny, uh, control my destiny. And so I, in, in our industry, I'm sure that they, the, the leaders of the industry in terms of the, um, the, big, the big data gatherers, and let's, we can just you know, call them out, it's, it's, it's Google and Facebook who essentially are going to be, uh, and Amazon, of course, um, who can really get ahead of this and not uh, you know, s stand idly by and allow for legislators. And we saw them in, in, in the Senate asking questions. I'm not sure if that group is the right ones to be dictating uh, and leading the conversation. They have, they have a, a great opportunity to get out in front and lead. They know that there's going to be certain regulations that could be very um, close to or the equivalent of what's going on with the GDPR in, in, uh, in Europe. Many of the global advertisers right now have to comply with that or are complying with that. I mean, they've got up until the 25th of May to do so. Uh, so we've got a blueprint. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a blueprint to follow. And, uh, and I think that they're gonna, I think they're gonna, you know, they're gonna stand up and, and, and take control of that themselves and make recommendations. I, I, I would bet on it. Okay. I think it is a blueprint to some extent, um, but it is a different privacy regime. And the fact of the matter is, if you're not aware, there's not a national data protection law in this country, in the United States. Um, you may think that you have a fundamental right to information privacy. You actually don't. Um, it, it, as a legal matter, there are constitutional protections around privacy, bodily privacy, and you know freedom from search and seizure. So you have certain sort of, I don't know, geographic privacy, if you will, or bodily privacy protections that are enshrined in the Constitution, but you don't, in fact, have a fundamental data privacy right. The Europeans do, and that's built into their, you know, their, their charter, the charter of the European Union itself. You're so scaring they, everybody, by the way. Peter, sorry, just so it's, you know. it's true. So, the, so in Europe, it's, it's, um, they treat privacy very seriously as a fundamental human right, and that just filters into their legal approach on everything. So what John mentioned, which is, you know, we're just a month away from the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Data privacy law comes around every so often on this magnitude, but not that often. This is the most significant change in, in decades, literally. So since 1995, Europe hasn't had a significant change of, of this scale and magnitude. And since we're now in the digital arena, and we're all tied together through data, you know, data knows no boundaries, you have to be aware of it, even if you, aren't, you don't serve customers in the European Union. It's going to have a very influential effect on how the world looks at data privacy. And given that there's no standard here in this, state, in this country currently, 
I would wager that the rest of the world is going to start looking to Europe as setting that baseline and not the United States, despite the fact that we are the largest consumer marketplace. We do, in fairness, have um, data breach notification laws in place, 50 different ones. They're at the state level, so there's not even a federal level. But just to compare it to Europe, I mean, Europe has cabinet level officials who are responsible for privacy. They're called DPAs, data protection authorities. And there's one in every member state, and there's one for the EU as a whole. We have no data protection authority in the United States. The closest you would have a proxy to that would be the Federal Trade Commission as a body. That's the consumer protection body in this country. And they do set very stringent rules on how to handle data. There are significant penalties associated with data breach in the tens of millions of dollars, and they, they'll hit you. And this does not make a company like Facebook or Google immune, as you've seen in the Cambridge Analytica scandal. You know, they'll get hauled right in front of Congress when something goes wrong. But you know, will this lead to actual legislation here, and you know, legislation or regulation here? I don't know that I agree that it will. I mean, I think companies would be smart to look to what's happening in Europe and set that, but it remains to be seen. And just quickly, industry has responded and has been very pro uh, proactive with two efforts that I would encourage you all to, to look at further if you're online marketers. One is called the Digital Advertising Alliance, mm -hmm. and that's a consortium of all the major trade bodies in this country, the ANA representing brands, brand marketers, the 4As representing advertising agencies, the IAB, Interactive Advertising Bureau, representing online publishers and content services, um, the NAI, the Network Advertising Initiative, which represents uh, ad delivery platforms online, the DMA, the Direct Marketing Association. There's a whole bunch. They came together. They created a program called Ad Choices. And this is a consumer-focused program. It's been in existence since 2009. So every online ad that you see that's behaviorally targeted, that's using web viewing data for the purpose of targeting that ad, that's personal data, certainly by the European definition. Um, consumers are notified by that through the Ad Choices program. They see a little triangular blue icon in the ad. That signifies that it is a behaviorally targeted ad. They click on that icon. They get more information about the advertisement, what data it contains, why did they get it. You know, it may be a, a, an ad that has nothing to do with where they are right now, but it's been targeted because it's based on a website they just visited. And they can opt out if they so choose. Um, the other body is called the uh, Trustworthy Accountability Group, or TAG. Um, and that is a group of the four ANA, the brands, the Association of National Advertisers, the four A's, and the IAB. And that's really for the industry itself. That's not a consumer-facing program. That's about creating trust in the ecosystem itself making sure that ad fraud doesn't occur, that brands are showing up in safe places, that everyone in the ecosystem is doing trustworthy things according to a code of conduct that the industry sets. In neither of these cases are they driven by law and regulation. This is businesses acting proactively and recognizing that consumers need to have a voice and that, frankly, we on the digital side need to get our act together in a very safe way. So, John, let's change the, the, the direction just a little bit here for a, little, for a few minutes. What are some of the most exciting things I can anticipate as a consumer in the next few years that will come from the area of data science, auto automated intelligence, and things like that from the marketing perspective as a consumer? What are the exciting things that I'm going to see in the future? I think the continuation of more personalized experiences. Uh, I, I said it at, on the, at the onset. Uh, I think that. Brands need to, to add value to people's lives. And in doing so, they need to create personal experiences. And by using AI and, and using data, they can create those. Um, some of those have to do with uh, offering different platforms and products and services in a very unique way, in a very individual way. Um, I, think, I think for us, time is the issue, right? We are a, a society right now that just will do anything to save time. And so if a brand uses smart data, uh, uses data in a very smart way, excuse me, uh, and then uses artificial intelligence for the delivery of, of a unique idea or a unique, unique value proposition or something uniquely creative, a unique experience, um, that saves people time. I think that that brand will win. I think the consumer experience will win. I think we also have these liquid expectations where we want everything that we do and touch today to operate like other things that we're accustomed to, to doing, right? So I want every experience that I have on application on my mobile device to respond to me just like Uber does. And I hate when people use Uber as an example because they do it at every conference, but it's the first one I thought of. But it's, um, 
it's, it's, I, I just want to be able to have it immediately at my disposal. And I think that that's the same kind of experience that many brands right now are thrust up against because they're not set up to deliver that. So I think in the future, uh, not, not so far in the future, I think businesses right now going through a digital transformation are adjusting their way of delivery, their uh, communication, and also the value that they give to consumers in a much more efficient, more personalized way. And that, that I think is exciting because it doesn't waste my time. It gets me right to the heart of the things that I need. Uh, I'm tremendously bullish on voice activated devices. I mean, I reshaped my agency about a year ago to essentially focus on Facebook, Google, and Amazon, right? And, um, and I just, I live and breathe my Echo device for the last year. And while I love my Google Home device, and I'm not a huge fan of the Apple HomePod, but um, just because I think it's too expensive and Siri doesn't work that great, but my Amazon experience, my, my, my Alexa experience is just unbelievable. And the way that they inspire me to, to get involved in certain content and to take advantage of certain products and services through the inspirational phase, all the way through the e-commerce purchasing phase is what makes me excited. I mean, I, I moved a year ago uh, into a new apartment, and I, I believe I bought 95% of everything in my apartment from Amazon using the Amazon app and or Alexa, and never went to a store. And not that I'm lazy, but it was just that convenient. And so that was really exciting. Why? I got all my time back. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it was much more valuable. And well, so I think that's an experience. I'd love to pick up on a theme that John has hit on, which is, I think, super important, and that is, is the human angle of this. Because you know, you, in conversations like this, you can get really caught up in the, the technology, how, it's just, how efficient it is and powerful, and it's leveraging all these things and saving money and delivering great results. But you know, if it doesn't have a sort of a resonant human connection at the core of that, and you know, it, it, I think important to note, you know, AI as a as a technology discipline got its start in voice recognition. Yep. That was one of the very first iterations back in the 70s. You know, Ray Kurzweil, the MIT Media Lab, it, it had that's where it started, and that's very interesting, isn't it? Because of all the places you could start with a technology like that, it was the human voice. So my you know my advice is, if you look at this technology, if you're developing this technology. Bear that in mind. It's, it's got to be grounded in a, in a real fundamental human connection. And I would take that further and say that you know, one of the areas that, of AI today that I'm most in, intrigued uh, with is called Hive AI. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not Hive computing. That's something different. That's like you know, massively parallel processing. That's been around for a long time, too. This is literally looking at the behavior of bee colonies as a source of thinking around how to leverage technology. So it's, it's in, you know, in the example of bees, and I won't go off on a tangent here, you know, there's a technology in play. I mean, they actually communicate through you know, the motion of their wings and other ways they communicate with the queen. But it's the fact that they're doing things collectively. They're building hives. They're locating where the hives go. They're creating the honey. And they're doing it in a very collective way. But it's actual organic motion and movement that's doing this that's enabled by something bigger. So if we, you know, if we continue to pursue things where there's humans at the center of this, where we're looking at human behaviors and thinking and sort of creating a hive mind, if you will, that AI enables, that's great. So don't let the data sort of take you there. Let the data inform and enhance what you're doing. Let's, let's keep going down this path a little bit because I think it's a really important one that I can imagine how the AI would inform what ad to put in front of me, for example, but that ad still has to have that personal touch, that, yeah. that, that spark of creativity, all of the other elements that we have come to associate with successful marketing campaigns. Talk to me a little bit about how you in this field you know, capitalize or create campaigns that still have that creative human touch, the, the piece that's going to go from me being an observer to a buyer, mm -hmm. I guess. John, why don't you go first? So I would say that there's sort of two angles to this. I think one, um, the data-driven creativity uh, allows us to, again, just give them a, a deeper understanding of what individual consumers want and desire, and also some patterns of things that they may be interested in, and help to inform the way that we approach them. Not only with, uh, because my, you know, an advertising agency, whether it's mine or any others, um, we don't sell anything but remarkable ideas. It's, it's all we sell. We don't sell data. We, we absolutely don't, we shouldn't, uh, data, data is a commodity, and the usage of data is a, quite a commodity as well. So that doesn't really bode well for our business model if, if, that's what we're, if that's what we're all about. 
Um, it's about using data to inform uh, a group of unbelievably creative people that can develop inspiring messaging and visuals, um, as well as voice, because I don't believe necessarily we're going to go into an age where we're going to have lots of opportunity for so many visuals. Uh, I think uh, with voice activation, I think we're going to limit a lot of that. Um, to create experiences that, again, add value to a consumer. I don't believe it's about just offering up a product. For example, if you have an Alexa device today, and I'm always, uh, this is our challenge right now, which is if, you, if you've ordered soap and you say, hey, Alexa, order me some soap, it's just going to reorder the soap that you've had. If right now today I want to uh, book a trip from Miami to Barcelona, I would just say, Alexa, book me a trip from Miami to Barcelona, leaving tomorrow, coming back Sunday. It already knows I'm an AA member. It has my American Airlines number. It knows I like a window seat. It knows I like, a tra I like to travel after 5 o'clock. So where's the opportunity for another airline to jump in and circumvent that process? There's no opportunity. So there's no opportunity for advertising, right? So we have to, we have to be prepared for those moments or lack of those moments. Um, and, and, in, and to do so, I think we need to create more inspiring experiences for consumers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, to your point, the, the, the data will help inform great ideas, but AI will help us deliver them fast and efficiently mm -hmm. and to the, at the right moment that we feel that the consumer is about to you know, make a purchase so we can add value to the experience that they're already in. Yeah. I see it uh, affect, and I agree completely with what John said. Uh, I, I see it adding. Um, value in terms of uh, just in terms of the you know the audiences that it can reach I think AI is going to dig into th and reveal things and certain insights that just sort of I don't know typical technology may not um, you know for example it could be that you have a lot of information on you know an Audi buying segment you know Audi buyers um, but you didn't realize within that there's a, they have a you know they have the, the male Audi drivers anyway love you know Zara suits for example they just love to buy suits at Zara. So AI might be able to sort of reveal other insights about folks in a segment that you're already working with that could somehow further inform like, well, I, normally I wasn't really thinking of looking at an Audi segment to sell, you know, to create a Zara campaign, but now I'm going to, and the AI algorithms reveal that to me. It's a very basic example. But, you know, the technology can really be pushed in directions that reveal all sorts of interesting connections, relevant, accurate, informed co connections that can really make you smarter about the advertising you're doing. The other point I would make is, is on the creativity side. And, you know, again, we talk a lot about tech, and that sounds all very dry and logical, but, you know, I'm most excited by the creative possibilities, and that's the essence of what advertising is and always has been as a business. And I, you know, I think that where the industry, you know, candidly right now is struggling a little bit is we're still in a very much a, an interruptive mode. Like we're trying to get your attention. So we're trying to make the ad smarter and more targeted and more informed so that that split second that we've got you, we've really got your attention. But really that keeps winnowing down and we're, you know, eventually it's going to be to the point of diminishing returns where there's nothing there. People only have so much time and they're more mobile and so we're going where they're going. But I think what will be interesting to see is when advertising becomes more experiential. Like it is such an intuitive part of someone's life. And it may be an invitation experience. It may be like, you know, I don't really want to talk to this brand right now. I'll invite you in when I'm ready, when I feel that I'm ready. And then I'll really, you know, I'll really appreciate your, your moment there. There's no way we're getting to that point without AI. Yeah, like because that, re that requires very robust technology. Mm -hmm. And that's where it will go. And so the people that get really worried about like, oh, we're just going to keep you know, breaking rules around consumers, no, we're listening. And you know, consumers are saying, hey, I've only got so much time. I don't like being creeped out. I don't want to be interrupted. We'll get there to the point where this feels more natural and more welcomed, and AI will be the engine. How does all of this change the people that you hire into your agencies? I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the kind of people I would see in your offices or in your businesses that are driving this? What are their skills? Mm -hmm. What are you looking for? You know, that's a great, that's that a great a question, um, Jeff. I would say that um, I'm a huge believer in, um, I said this line in, at the shop where we've got high value tasks and low value tasks. I believe that all the low value tasks because of machine learning, AI, all the technologies that we use for delivery, dissemination, even for the, much of the discovery and research, uh, while it's necessary to do some low value tasks to learn our business, and I think it's a, it's a, uh, you know, a launching pad or, or a learning ground for, for, for young people to come in after they've perhaps maybe gone to college, and maybe not, maybe they're just uh, out, of, uh, out of high school, uh, or not as well. Um, uh, I believe that that's a, uh, an area where they can start, but I think at the, at the end of the day, they, they need to start to develop much more critical thinking, high value 
task skills, which are, uh, and I, and I'm, I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sore topic for me because I was, a, when I was younger, I was a musician, and so I believe in the arts, and uh, and I believe that we haven't invested as much as we need to in the arts because that I think is going to be one of the most critical skills, um, you know, moving forward is the is the ability to see data, see things, uh, and then develop creative solutions. Um, we don't need. Pro, you know, for, for 20 years, people said, well, learn the, art, the, the language of programming. And I think that AI has now learned its own language of programming. So we don't even need many more programmers. Uh, I think technologists, they'll be very high-level ones. I'm not sure you're going to need the mass quantity of low-value ones as we have today. So uh, I have a 14-year-old boy. I, you know, I'm not pushing him in that direction. Uh, I'm pushing him towards the arts to be a critical thinker. And so that's the kind of staff I look for. So I kind of put my money where my mouth is when it comes to hiring and also raising my kid. Peter, how about you? Yeah, I know we're running out of time, but just real quick, um, John's absolutely right, and that's a big challenge for a lot of agencies is you know, attracting and retaining really good quality content, sorry, a talent that gets what's happening with content. Um, you heard uh, Vincente Fox speak earlier today about the importance of the university system. We have the University of Miami right here as our moderator. That's critical, and we're very proud <laughs> about the, you know, the university culture that, that we have in the United States, and that attracts people from all over the world. That's a brain trust that we need to invest in and promote and make sure that that's a, you know, that's a critical part of how we look at this. I think at the end of the day, you know, what I would look at in a person is sort of a multidisciplinary skill set. You know, I feel like that's, that's the example that I set, so it's what I would like to see in others. You know, I'm not an attorney, and yet I make an effort to understand how law and policy works and how it impacts my business. I'm not a technologist, I don't write code, but I make the effort to understand how the technology works Agreed. and what its applications are. So the more sort of dexterity of thinking that you have and then you can bring that in, it, it, you know, it suits you well actually because you're gonna have you know, a fairly broad impact on the organization that you'll, you'll serve or, or contribute to. Um, that's increasingly critical because these are very complex issues. It, it happens all over the world, all these different kinds of brands, consumer types, you just need to have that, that, uh, you know, that openness in your mindset of how you approach it. John, Peter, thank you for a great session. Audience, thank, thank you very you, much. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thanks for having us.